Hi everyone, so um, like I said, I was going to record the lectures from the J-Term. Um, this will be a series of two lectures on Module 3 for photosynthesis. Um, and I'm going to start with the, the big idea um, in terms of what is photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is basically the process by which um, organisms known as photoautotrophs can convert energy that comes in the form of sunlight or light into energy that's stored in organic compounds. So one big thing that I would like to emphasize is the idea of us being able to take sunlight and in some way um, convert that into a molecule that we have that's, that contains lots of potential energy, like glucose. Um, and we have to remember the first law of thermodynamics, and that's the idea that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it's just transformed from one form um, into another. And uh, the reason why I mention that is because when I say that photoautotrophs convert um, the energy in the sun into energy that's stored in organic compounds, I don't want you to think that these photoautotrophs um, make energy. They do not make en energy. However, they can um, transform light energy into chemical energy through this process of photosynthesis. I mean, that's a pretty big distinction to make. Um, so what is an autotroph? An autotroph is an organism that is a self-feeder, um, and they can sustain themselves without taking in energy from any other organisms. Um, typically what we see in life is that this is done through the process of photosynthesis or another thing called uh, chemisynthesis. Um, and some examples of photoautotrophs could be plants, algae, even bacteria. Um, and then the third question that you'll see in red is, what is an organic compound? Um, and we define an organic compound as a molecule that contains um, typically carbon and hydrogen. Um, some examples of that could be carbohydrates, and that is the, the primary product of photosynthesis. Or we could have uh, lipids, we talked about proteins, uh, nucleic acids, um, so those are all examples of organic compounds. As you'll see on the picture with the leaf, um, we have sunlight coming into this leaf, we have carbon dioxide coming into this leaf, we have water coming into this leaf, um, and then out of the leaf is oxygen and glucose. One distinction I'd like for you to realize is that carbon dioxide is not considered to be an organic compound. Um, if we define organic compounds as just carbon and hydrogen, things that are made of carbon and hydrogen, um, they have to be made of carbon and hydrogen. Carbon dioxide um, is made up of only carbon and oxygen. Uh, there's no hydrogen there, so it's actually considered to be an inorganic compound. So we're starting with inorganic material, and we're ending with... Um, glucose, a glucose molecule, and that's an organic compound. Um, so let's see where this fits in. Um, as you'll see up at the top, the image states that less than one billionth of the sun's total energy reaches the Earth's outer atmosphere. And then you see arrows coming uh, from that um, description. And what I want you to focus on is uh, the part at the bottom that says 0.02% captured by photosynthesis. And that's really important um, because there is a vast amount of energy that, that is coming from the sun, and only a very, very, very small fraction of that energy is actually being used um, to produce organic material through the process of photosynthesis. Not to mention... Um, that the majority of the photosynthesis that's going on in the, in the Earth um, isn't due to uh, plants or organisms that we see with our eyes. The majority of the photosynthesis that, that is going on is being done by algae uh, in the ocean. So the majority of the um, oxygen that we're breathing is actually being produced as a byproduct of photosynthesis from those algae organisms uh, that, are, that are living in the, uh, the oceans. So you'll see here this uh, biogeochemical cycle. 
and that is um, basically a cycle of uh, living organisms using um, materials that are non-living. Um, and it's this cycle from living organisms then dying and that becoming um, a part of the non-living environment or the abiotic environment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's through this biogeochemical cycle um, that energy is being transferred from living organisms to the atmosphere, to rocks and sediments, seawater and freshwater, and there's this cycle that's going on that's allowing for us to maintain the uh, first law of thermodynamics. And so if we, um, if we think about how this fits into our big picture, um, I want you to remember that all organisms require an input of energy to survive, um, and we can classify them into, uh, I would say, two broad categories depending on how they obtain that energy. So we have autotrophs, and those are typically known as producers. And the autotrophs, like I said before, those are able to transform energy from the environment, like sunlight or chemicals, um, and produce organic compounds. And then the other uh, broad category of organisms that we have on Earth are known as heterotrophs, and those are typically referred to as consumers. So consumers, on the other hand, um, they have to rely on organic materials or organic compounds that were produced by uh, other organisms. Examples of autotrophs, plant algae, some bacteria, and then um, examples of heterotrophs, animals like us, fungi, protozoa, and, um, and also some, some bacteria as well. Um, so what I'd like for you to do is look at this ecological pyramid that you see and the energy that's captured through photosynthesis um, we can study that looking by looking at this ecological pyramid and seeing how energy um, is uh, being produced by each level of the uh, organisms that live live on earth. We see that a hundred percent of the energy that is being consumed up through that pyramid, if we start from the bottom to the top, a hundred percent of that energy is actually starting with the energy of the producers in the environment. Then 10% of the energy that's being provided to the environment is coming from primary consumers. So that would be the organisms that are consuming the uh, producers. And then 1% uh, of that energy is coming from energy of secondary consumers, and they would be the ones who are consuming primary consumers. And then 0.1% uh, of the energy is coming from the energy of tertiary consumers. And those, um, of course, would be at the top of the ecological pyramid. And what we'll see is that the biomass that's generated, like it says on the screen, the biomass that is generated by producers supports nearly all the living organisms on the planet. And that's a, that's a, pretty, um, that's a pretty big deal. So photosynthesis is extremely essential to, um, to our life as heterotrophs, um, but it's really essential to nearly all living things and processes that go on in Earth. And um, one last note that I want to mention is that we need many, many producers in an ecosystem um, in order for that ecosystem to be sustainable. And the reason for that is because that not all of the energy that is produced by producers is transferred to the next trophic level. And so that means that some of that energy that's being um, used to produce organic material by producers is actually... Um, being lost to heat, it's being lost to um, other sources, and it's not transferred up to the next um, trophic level. And as a result, to compensate for that, we need to increase the number of producers that we have so that the number of primary consumers can be fed, uh, and then secondary consumers and tertiary consumers and so, so forth and so on. Um, so what we'll see here, excuse me, is that uh, as we increase the trophic level, um, we really rely on the previous trophic level in order to, to uh, power uh, our cells. So a first trophic level producer would produce organic material that could then be used to, to um, 
supply energy to the secondary trophic level and then the third trophic level and the fourth trophic level and so forth and so on. Um, and each step along the way, heat from the metabolic conversions going from first trophic levels to secondary trophic levels is being lost to the environment. Um, and uh, so we can see that as the, the red hours that are coming from each of the different um, organisms on the screen. But it's all starting with energy coming into our system from the sun. So if we, we were to remove the, the sun from the picture, um, none of the other layers would be, would be able to exist. So it really relies on this energy coming from the sun and then being passed from one trophic level to the next in a pyramid type of, type of um, scheme. So this is just a, a description, a, a general idea as to how this fits in. We have energy from the, the sun um, being used to power the process of photosynthesis, which is the production of um, organic material. And then that organic material in plants needs to be broken down into ATP, or energy. And so um, if we were to think about the, the process that's going on in our body as humans, we aren't photosynthesizing. We're simply doing cellular respiration. And so we have the starting material of, of glucose, for example, and we break down that glucose and store that energy in uh, a molecule known as ATP. Whereas plants need to first harvest the energy from the sun, convert it into glucose, and then break down that glucose into ATP and use the ATP in order to process, in order to uh, power the processes that go on inside of their cells. So it's a two-step process in uh, plants, for example, whereas we are consuming plants or consuming organisms that produce their own organic material, and then we break it down. So we have an easier job in terms of being able to harvest our energy as opposed to, to plants that are doing both photosynthesis and cell respiration. And that whole idea of being able to um, pull in um, carbon dioxide from the environment and um, form um, organic material from that carbon dioxide is known as carbon fixation. And so we can define carbon fixation as the reduction Remember Leo Ger, so reduction means gain of electrons of organic compound of, of organic carbon in the form of or, uh, carbon dioxide, and we use that to form organic compounds uh, by living organisms. So carbon fixation is the reduction of inorganic carbon to form organic compounds. And it can only happen, carbon, carbon fixation can only happen in, in living organisms. Mm -hmm. So um, what we'll, we'll talk about in the first, um, and this is just describing the, what is being oxidized and what is being reduced in the, the process of photosynthesis. So CO2 is going to be reduced and be used to form C6H12O6 or glucose. And then we're going to use water um, in order to form this byproduct through the uh, process of photosynthesis and that will be the byproduct will be O2 oxygen. So that was a, a pretty unique uh, animation as to what's going on inside plants as they produce uh, organic material. Um, and so what I would like to do as we start uh, this conversation of photosynthesis is explain the different organs that are involved in leaves in order to perform um, this process. So the first thing you'll see is cuticle. Um, and I'll describe what a cuticle is. A cuticle in a plant is basically a waxy layer that helps prevent the leaf from losing too much water through uh, this process known as transpiration. And um, what I want you to remember really about the cuticle is that it's made up of lipids and lipids like waxes are hydrophobic. And so we would expect that if water were to come in contact with the cuticle of a leaf, um, it would not be absorbed through that layer of organ, but instead it would roll off that layer of organ, just like um, it would, uh, water would roll off 
um, a piece of plastic or something that is um, something that is waxy like wax paper. Um, and so if we think about some evolutionary adaptations to having this type of cuticle, we have to realize that this adaptation will actually allow uh, plants that are living in dry environments to um, block the escape of water by osmosis. And what's that going to do for the plant? It's going to help that plant maintain homeostasis even in severely dry um, external conditions. So the thicker the cuticle, um, we typically see the drier the environment. And there's this relationship between a very thick cuticle and um, preventing the loss of water through transpiration um, in extremely hot and dry environments. Then the new, next two things that we see um, labeled are the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis. And these two organs provide a barrier from the external environment um, from the other uh, cells that exist inside the leaf. And we can think of these two um, epidermis layers as the same thing that our, our uh, skin is doing. The um, next one that ch um, is up here is, is this Palsidae mesophyll. And, um, and then I'll open this one up, the spongy mesophyll. So these two layers of mesophyll are um, actually labeled in red because those cells are the, um, those two layers of, of cells are the ones that have uh, the most chloroplasts in them. And a chloroplast, like we, we know from before, is the organelle that's inside plant cells that actually um, are where photosynthesis is going on. So it's within the chloroplasts that are found within the mesophyll cells labeled there that um, we actually have photosynthesis going on. And if you look at the spongy mesophyll, you'll see that there are these spaces in between each of the cells. And those spaces are um, for gases that are being produced as byproducts when we, um, when we undergo the process of photosynthesis. And they're also for um, storage of oxygen um, and CO2. So we have uh, gases being stored there, and then they can be taken into the cells when they're needed, or they can be released from the cells and be stored there to then be released from uh, the leaf itself. The next thing we'll see is um, these openings at the bottom of the leaf that are called the stoma, and the plural form of stoma is uh, stomata, and the stomata is actually um, a pore inside the, the leaf. It's at the bottom of the leaf. They're, they're made up of uh, these two types of cells that are called guard cells, and they do exactly that. They guard the opening that uh, will allow for gases to enter and exit the leaf. Um, so if a gas or water needs to come into the leaf or out of the leaf, um, that will be done through the stoma itself, or the stomata of the plant. Um, we'll see this bundle sheath cells, um, and it's cut off, but the bundle sheath are actually these cells right here in, in the purple color. And they protect, they form this uh, barrier around two organs inside leaves known as the xylem and the phloem. And the xylem and the phloem actually make up the vascular tissue of the plant. And that is where water can be transported um, and sugar sources can be transported as well. So we have um, the xylem, and the xylem is particularly responsible for the transport of, wa transport of water in a unidirectional way. That means only in one direction, and that direction is going from the roots of the plant to the shoots of the plant. So that would be the leaves um, in, in vascular plants. And then the phloem, which is a different type of tube, the phloem is actually used for the transport of sugars from uh, sugar sources 
to sugar sinks. And a sugar sink um, is an area of the plant that is storing or using sugar. And that could be seen as the roots of the plant, or that could be in an area of the plant that is growing, or the flower of the plant. Um, but the, the phloem is actually uh, able to move sugars in, um, in two different ways. Uh, it's not unidirectional like the xylem of the plant is. Um, and uh, so it's, it's basically a, um, a roadway where sugar molecules can, can move from one area of the plant to, to another. Um, the xylem of the, of the plant is what's providing the water uh, to be used during the light reactions of photosynthesis. And I'll explain what the light reactions of photosynthesis are a little bit later. And then the phloem is what is transporting the carbohydrates from the leaves of the plant to other parts of the plant during um, another phase of photosynthesis that's known as the Calvin cycle. And like I said, I'll explain what that phase of photosynthesis is later. Um, one pretty important thing I want you to know about the xylem is that it is made up of dead tissue. And um, the dead tissue that xylem is made up of is actually known as uh, lign uh, lignin, and lignin is a, um, is a polar molecule. And so um, given that it's a polar molecule and water is a polar molecule, there uh, can be interactions that allow for water to move through those tubes in a, in a fairly easy way. Um, and so the polarity, exchange, the, the polarity between the water molecules and the material that makes up that organ, that particular organ, is really important for the movement of water throughout plants. So this is just a, an expanded diagram of what uh, all these different um, organs or organelles of the plant uh, do and, and how they fit uh, within uh, the larger picture. So we see mesophyll, and that would be the spongy mesophyll or um, the palisade uh, mesophyll that we see. And that is um, where the majority of photosynthesis is going on. If we were to zoom into one of those cells in that area, we would see um, a cell that's filled with lots and lots of chloroplasts, and that is what gives gives plants their their green color. Um, we'd also see the stomata and the exchange of CO2 and oxygen uh, through those the holes of the the stomata underneath the underside of the plant. And, um, and then this larger picture here is actually one uh, particular chloroplast inside one of the, um, in the mesophyll cells. And we'll see a, a cross-section of the chloroplast. And the cross-section of the chloroplast actually exposes us to something called the thylakoid. Um, and the thylakoid is... I like to describe them as like peppermint patties or coins that have been stacked up onto each other to form these larger units that are called grana or granum. And it's within the thylakoid that the, um, the first step of photosynthesis is going on. The, the most important step of photosynthesis is going on. And that's where uh, light energy, photons of, of light that are coming from the sun or some sort of light source, it's where molecules are being excited um, and are, are um, losing electrons in order to power an electron um, transport chain and to form a chemical, an electrochemical gradient that can help us produce um, some product at the end that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but that's just a, a general overview. You can see here, this is... Um, this begonia plant, like most land plants, has more stomata on the underside of its leaves than on the top. The stomata control transpiration as well as the exchange of gases within the plant. The stomate is like a pore. Two cells called guard cells surround the stomate and can open and close in response to the amount of water in the plant the light intensity, and the level of carbon dioxide in the air.
Behind the stomata are air spaces that are saturated with water. A continuous chain of water molecules runs from the cells of the root hairs to these air spaces in the leaf, which form a link with the stomatal pores. Evaporation of water from leaf surfaces through the stomata provides the momentum for water to keep moving from root to leaf. And so um, we, we talked a little bit about the, the organs of the leaves that are really important um, for photosynthesis, but let's get a, a bit of a bigger picture and um, think about the surface area of leaves and why uh, surface area is a fairly important concept to talk about when we, when we think about photosynthesis. Um, leaves have lots of surface area, and the reason uh, for surface area in terms of evolution is to allow us to and, and sort of facilitate the increase in the absorption of sunlight. Um, so what I want you to think about is, are there really any drawbacks to leaves having a large surface amount of surface area? And I'm sure you can think of many different reasons, but the one I, I really want to focus in on is this idea that um, although lots of surface area facilitates the absorption of, of more sunlight, and then we'd see photosynthesis occurring at a faster rate, what I also think you should be focusing on is that having lots of surface area also allows more transpiration to take place through the, through the stoma on the underside of the leaves in uh, dry environments. And so that can actually lead to desiccation of the plant or the drying out of the plant. And in response to a desiccation through billions of years of evolution, many species of plants uh, that exist in that exist in, in environmental conditions that are uh, super dry, they actually have adapted to that um, in order to limit the amount of transpiration that, that goes on in their in their leaves. Um, and that comes in the form of maybe closing their stomata at certain times or um, uh, having smaller leaves or um, different adaptations that, that could limit the surface area or at least decrease the transpiration that's going on inside, inside their plants, inside their leaves. So let's go um, Let's go back down to, to a more microscopic level of uh, the plants into the chloroplast. And in eukaryotes, the, the photosynthesis takes place inside um, the chloroplast inside cells. So we're inside the leaf. In the leaves, we have millions and millions of cells. Inside the cells, we have chloroplasts. And it's within the chloroplast that photosynthesis is going on. And if we were to dissect this chloroplast and look at the different membranes and levels that are inside there, we'd see that chloroplasts have three major membranes. They have an outer membrane, they have an inner membrane that we can see, and then they have a thylakoid membrane that's folded to form um, uh, thylakoids. And these thylakoids are arranged in stacks and we call those different stacks, you can see them here, um, these stacks, the plural uh, form of the name for this is grana. If we were to talk about just one stack, that would be uh, a granum. So the way I think of uh, granum or grana is, like I said earlier, like a York peppermint patty that's um, stacked in, in a layer, and... Um, it's within that grana, in the thylakoids that make up that grana, that photosynthesis is going on. And then you'll see, in addition to that, this, this term right here, it says stroma. And it is the, the stroma that is basically, I, the way I think of it, it's like the cytoplasm that's within one individual chloroplast. Um, but it's basic, it is made up of fluid, uh, water, and it's the stuff that um, surrounds the grana that are within the, the chloroplast. Um, and uh, so what I'd like for you to know about uh, the structure of the membranes that make up this chloroplast is that 
the membranes are made of a phospholipid bilayer and the, the, the membranes are embedded with uh, different proteins. And if we think about some benefits of having membranes, what is a, a benefit of having a membrane in, um, in any type of cell? It really is uh, to allow us to separate different or incompatible processes into different areas. Um, so if we need one process to go on in one part of the cell and another process to go on in another part of the cell and the products of those two processes aren't compatible, uh, in terms of evolution what we see is typically when that happens we put a membrane around the area of the cell where that process is going on so that there's no interaction of products that are, um, that are being produced. And uh, the second major benefit that we have of membranes is the, the ability to build a concentration gradient by having two, um, two distinct layers in separate areas. So if we needed to um, have some sort of concentration gradient, think cell respiration, in order to form or power ATP synthase, um, we could pump uh, hydrogen ions to one side of that gradient and then use the, um, the, the gradient, the idea that we have lots of concentration of hydrogen ions on one side and not so much on the other side as a way of powering reactions, as a way of turning, um, in the case of cell respiration, respiration, the enzyme we know as uh, ATP synthase and being able to convert ADP, an inorganic phosphate, into this high uh, energy molecule known as ATP. So those are two major benefits of having membranes, and we'll see, similar to um, in the process of cell respiration, that uh, the membranes in the chloroplast are also uh, extremely important in terms of being able to produce this concentration gradient. Um, and the, the last thing that we'll see, the last bullet point that's, that's on the bottom of the slide, um, is with regard to uh, pigment molecules. There's a pigment molecule that's in the that's stuck, or we like to say embedded in the thylakoid membrane of the plant, uh, chloroplast, and the the pigment molecule is known as chlorophyll, and it is from this molecule that um, plants typically appear to be green. And if a plant has uh, a different color, it just means that an additional pigment molecule is also stuck or embedded in the thylakoid membrane. Um, but chlorophyll is, is by far the most important of, of all the pigments that exist in plants. And we'll go into a little bit more depth with, with that a little bit later. So we said at the beginning um, that light to be more specific, sunlight is probably the most important in terms of us being able to, to convert inorganic materials that exist into organic materials. It's the source of energy that powers the reactions that allow us to produce these high energy molecules at the end of photosynthesis. Um, so I want to go into a little bit of the physics behind light and pigments that allows us to, to do these processes. Um, and so the, the biggest thing that you need to know about is that visible light is made up of uh, different colors of light um, and the colors of light are really a result of uh, waves having different wavelengths so if you were to think of the color red red doesn't really exist red is just um, various wavelengths various waves of light that have different wavelengths um, so we like to say that red might have a wavelength of 700 nanometers, uh, but I could consider something that has 690 nanometers or um, 720 nanometers to also be red. So when we say red, we really have to take into consideration the idea that red includes all of the waves that are that have a wavelength of maybe uh, 
680 nanometers to um, to about 750 nanometers. Um, a second property of light that you should know about is that light has a dual nature. That means that it can exist or it has properties of both waves and particles. Um, and if you take physics, if you take, I think, honors physics or AP physics, you'll talk about the dual nature of, of light. But for the sake of the AP test or the sake of photosynthesis, what you really should know is that um, light is coming from the sun or some light source in the form of a photon. And it's um, through that photon that we are exciting molecules in, um, in plants in order to, to power the reactions that go on in photosynthesis. So we're going to focus on the particle nature of, of light, and we will, anytime we refer, refer to a photon, I just want you to, to realize that what we're talking about is the particle aspect of light. Um, I, I do also want you to realize that the three primary colors of light are not the same as the three primary colors of pigments. Um, that you probably already know. So the three primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. And you may have seen that, that designation, like the RGB designation on your computer or on a projector or something like that. Um, but what I want you to think about is um, the idea that when you see something, so if you have a, a green Eagles jersey on, for example, that the reason why you're seeing green as opposed to some other color is because the green color um, that you see is a result of all of the wavelengths of light coming from the light source, maybe the lights in your house or the sunlight, shining onto that shirt, shining onto that object, interacting with the molecules and pigments that make up that object. And then certain wavelengths of light are being absorbed into those molecules, into the shirt itself, and certain wavelengths of light are being reflected. And it depends on the specific wavelengths of light that are being reflected off of the molecules that make up that shirt that allow us to see different colors. So in the case of the green shirt, all of the wavelengths of light that are being shined onto to that shirt are being absorbed into the molecules or, or they're exciting the molecules that make up that shirt. And only the green wavelengths that are being shined onto that uh, shirt are the ones that are bouncing off of those molecules and then right into our eyes and they are um, stimulating the cones these cells that exist in our eyes and then those um, those cones will send a signal an electrical signal to the brain that uh, we learned long long ago when we were babies to call uh, green so it's a it's a fairly complex process but uh, if we were to boil that, that whole message down, uh, the idea is this. It's that uh, when we see a color, the reason why we're seeing that color is because the wavelengths of light that are reflecting off of that object are the ones that are bouncing into our eyes. And so we see only those, those wavelengths. If the wavelength of light that's being shined onto to an object are not uh, being reflected, they're being absorbed, then that means it's not going to bounce off that object into our eyes, and so we won't see that color. And so I have two videos um, within the slideshow that you can you can go back and see, and I'll try and link those into this YouTube video that might help you understand it if you're if you're at all confused about light and pigment. Um, but I would like to go on to. Um, to describe how this works in plants. And so uh, pigments are, are molecules that absorb light energy. And different pigments absorb light of different wavelengths. And in plants, we have um, tons of different photosynthetic pigments. Some names that you'll, you'll hear are chlorophyll A molecules and chlorophyll B molecules and carotenoids and xanthophylls and carotenes um, or uh, tannins. Those are all different photosynthetic pigments that exist within um, uh, plant cells. And it is because 
of those pigments that um, plants are actually able to, I'll, I'll say, collect the photons of light that are um, shining on the plant cells themselves. So when you think of these different pigments, what I use in order to to sort of understand what they're doing inside the cell, what, what their function is, I like to refer to those pigments as light collecting buckets. And so that's why I have these three buckets down at the bottom. Um, they're light collecting buckets in that um, the, the different uh, wavelengths of light that we have shining on the plants are um, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, um, a blue, indigo, violet. So we have Roy G. Biv, we have uh, the visible light spectrum coming from the sun, it's shining onto these, these plant cells, and depending on what uh, pigment molecules we have inside those plants, that will determine what light can be absorbed into the plant and be used to power uh, some reactions, and what light is going to be reflected off of the plant and into our eyes and give us some sort of color that we'll perceive when we look at that plant. Um, I do want to emphasize as a little side note that the energy of a light is dependent on its frequency and it's not dependent on its wavelength. And that can be uh, somewhat complex, but I just want you to know that it's because of the light's frequency that it has its energy, not necessarily because of its, its wavelength. So another uh, analogy that I like to think to use to think of um, pigment molecules and photosynthetic pigment molecules is that I want you to imagine in, you're in this uh, weird world where um, $100 bills are falling from the sky and $20 bills and $50 bills and $5 bill and $1 bills are falling from the sky. You walk outside and you want to start collecting the, the money. But because you live in this strange world, the only way you can collect that money and keep it is if you have a particular bucket that uh, you have a particular bucket for the denomination of money that's falling from the sky. So if a $100 bill uh, is falling from the sky and a $50 bill is falling from the sky and a, hundred, and a $20 bill is falling from the sky and you only have a bucket that can catch $50 bills, then all of the $100 bills and all of the $20 bills that are falling from the sky uh, can't be, you can't collect those because you don't have a bucket to collect those, um, those denominations of money. And so in order for you to collect that money and keep it, you've got to have a bucket. And in the same sense, in order for us to, in order for plants to, to keep and collect the energy of light, the wavelengths of light or the frequency of light that's coming from the sun, uh, those plants need to have molecules that will be excited uh, by the, the wavelengths that are hitting them. So if the plant doesn't have a particular uh, molecule that's excited, for example, at blue light, when, when blue wavelengths of light are hitting it, then that plant can't use those wavelengths of light as a source of energy to power reactions. They don't have the, the buckets that are required to catch that light, and so they can't use it. And so plants are really dependent on uh, the different photosynthetic pigments that they have. If they don't have the pigments, then they can't collect those wavelengths of light that um, are being shined on them by, by the sun. And so this is, uh, this is chlorophyll A and B molecule. This is what it looks like. And we see in the chlorophyll A and B molecule that it has this long hydrocarbon uh, side chain. And it has this top part to the molecule that's known as a porphyrin ring. And it is in that porphyrin ring that uh, wavelengths of light are being absorbed. And the only difference between chlorophyll A molecules and chlorophyll B molecules is, is the, this R group that's added to the porphyrin ring. We have the CH3 that's being added for chlorophyll A, and the, um, the CHO, the uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen uh, functional group that's being added to chlorophyll B instead of the CH3. Um, so they're extremely similar in uh, molecular structure, the only difference is the, ad the addition of the different functional groups for chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. But I just wanted you to see uh, what one molecule of chlorophyll would look like. And um, so if, if we think about where these molecules are inside the plant, the molecules are actually uh, 
um, stuck, they're embedded inside the thylakoid membrane within chloroplasts. So if we're in the chloroplasts of the, the plant, the um, chlorophyll A, the chlorophyll B, and the other pigment molecules that we have are actually stuck inside proteins that this, the, the long hydrocarbon side chains that we see here, those side chains are stuck inside the proteins of plant, uh, of, of the thylakoid membrane. And the, the small section of this molecule that's not stuck is this porphyrin ring. And it's this ring that is being, uh, that's absorbing the light that's shining on it. So it's, it's stuck in place because its, its roots, I'll say, this hydrocarbon uh, side chain is actually embedded inside a protein and that protein is stuck inside the thylakoid membrane. So um, this image that you see here, the graph that you see here is called an absorption spectrum. Um, and an absorption spectrum shows different wavelengths of light in nanometers. So that's from like a little bit less than 400 nanometers in terms of um, wavelength up to like seven, a little bit more than 700 nanometers in wavelength. And then on the, the y-axis, we see the amount of light that's being absorbed by the one plant when all of the wavelengths of light are shining on that plant uh, or on the, on the pigments of that plant. And um, what we'll see is that red, blue, and violet light are um, being absorbed very well by those pigments. And... Uh, green and yellow light are not so well absorbed. And um, the way we see that is, is because at this section right here, between a little bit less than 550 nanometers up to like um, 630 nanometers, the amount of light that's being absorbed is super low. And so what does that mean about the pigments that we have or do not have? Um, it just means that the molecules that are, the, the pigments that we have, the pigments that are stuck inside the thylakoid membranes, aren't excited at those wavelengths of light. And if they're not excited, that means that those wavelengths are not being absorbed into those molecules, but instead they're reflecting off of the molecules that they're bouncing into, and they are going into our eyes, and they are the wavelengths of light that we see when we look at a plant. So what wavelengths do we see? We see these wavelengths um, right here between 550 and 640, and those are the colors green and yellow, which is why plants typically appear to be green and yellow in color as opposed to, to anything else. Um, the, so, so one of the questions in blue, it says, what's the advantage of having multiple pigments? And like I explained before, the advantage of having multiple pigments is that um, now the plants have the ability to absorb wavelengths of light that would have been otherwise lost. And when I say lost, I mean that those wavelengths of light would have been reflected or transmitted uh, off of the, the molecules that make up the plant and into some, some area that could be our eyes or into space or so forth and so on. And so each pigment molecule has a different absorption spectrum. And the, the pigment molecule absorbs some wavelengths of light that other pigment molecules might not absorb. And so I'll use the example of chlorophyll A, absorbing wavelengths of light between approximately 770 nanometers and like six, 690 nanometers that no other pigment um, absorbs. And if chlorophyll A were not present, then all of the light in that range could not be absorbed and then... Um, that could not be used to drive photosynthesis. Um, so it is an advantage to have multiple different pigments, um, pigment molecules that can be, um, that can help absorb wavelengths of light because we have available to us the full visible light spectrum, um, but plants don't necessarily use all of that light. And there's really no reason as to why they don't, um, but in terms of evolution, we just know that they don't. And that there is some variation between different plants, and, and we can see that uh, 
some plants have a higher concentration of chlorophyll B, and some might have a higher concentration of carotenoids, and some might have a higher concentration of chlorophyll A. But it just depends on the environment that they're living in and um, the, the intensity of light or, or um, the lack of light, the amount of shade that's there, and so forth and so on. So there's lots of variation in terms of the, the absorption spectrum depending on the, the different uh, pigment molecules that we have. So if I were to look at this graph here and ask what light is being absorbed and what light is being reflected, I would easily be able to see that the blue lines, the spikes, indicate uh, that, that uh, light is being absorbed and the red lines indicate when light is being absorbed. And any time um, we have a lower amount of absorption, that means that that light then is being reflected off of those molecules or off of that space and into our eyes. So the wavelengths of light that are being reflected are um, a little bit of light is being um, reflected off of 500 nanometers, between 500 nanometers and, and I'd say around 610 nanometers. And uh, for chlorophyll A, the bulk of the light that is being absorbed by chlorophyll A is between um, like 400 nanometers and 450, and then 650 nanometers and 675 nanometers. And then for chlorophyll A, the light that's being absorbed is between like 450 or a little bit more than 450 to uh, about 490, and then 6, 640 to like 6. Uh, 60. And so here you see two separate types of graphs. Um, what information does an absorption spectrum tell you? And um, what we can see is that it, it, it's showing you the wavelengths of light that are best absorbed by each type of pigment molecule. And then if you look at the the second question in blue, it says what information does the action spectrum tell you? And that is showing you how wavelength influences the rate of photosynthesis. And what I really would like for you to do is make sure you examine the axis labels of the graphs because that's going to tell you what the graph is showing. Um, the absorption spectrum shows that the pigment absorbs um, red and blue-violet light best and then reflects all the other colors. And the action spectrum, you see, is showing, however, that some photosynthesis occurs at nearly every wavelength of light, including yellow and green. Um, but because of, um, but it, but it actually occurs at the highest rate in the blue and the violet wavelengths and the red vi uh, wavelengths, and so the plants are going to appear mostly mostly green. And um, we, we knew this. We know that plants typically uh, throw a green, um, green color. And with that in mind, if we were to only give the plant um, red and blue wavelengths of light, the plant should grow just fine. And as an added benefit, we would be saving energy because the... Um, Light sources that we typically put on plants include the entire uh, spectrum of visible light. So we would have all of the colors of the rainbow being uh, shown on these on these the plants that allow them to grow. But plants would be, I could say, wasting the green light, the green wavelengths of light that that are um, being thrown on that object. And if we want to save some some money in terms of allowing us to grow plants um, the, in the most efficient way possible, what we could do is just eliminate, by using these LEDs, eliminate any of the energy that is wasted on illuminating uh, a green, uh, throwing a green wavelength. And if we eliminate that, then we save some money because we know plants aren't using the green anyway. That green light is just being reflected off of the objects and into our eyes. So knowing that, why put green light on a plant if uh, it's not being used to power photosynthesis? And so um, some of the grow lamps that you see, you can buy um, 
they just have red and and blue lights and that's because that's where the bulk of photosynthesis that that is the those are the wavelengths of light that photosynthesis um, photosynthetic pigment molecules use in order to to power the reactions that go on in photosynthesis and allow the plant to grow so as an overview for for what's going on in photosynthesis I'd like for you to look at this net overall equation and you'll see that six molecules of uh, CO2 and six molecules of water are being used to convert uh, used and they're converted into one molecule of C6H12O6 or glucose plus six molecules of oxygen and uh, that reaction requires light requires energy and so if I were to ask you is photosynthesis an endergonic or an exergonic reaction you should obviously say that it is an endergonic reaction and the reason why is because that it requires an input of energy in order to occur and as we can read the energy is coming in the form of light and it's dependent solely on the the frequency of that of the the incident light um, and so what we'll see is that photosynthesis occurs in two stages the first stage is sometimes known as a light reaction I like to call it a light dependent reaction and that's because that stage is dependent on light in order to happen and then the second stage of photosynthesis is known typically as the Calvin cycle sometimes people call it the Calvin Benson cycle sometimes people call it the dark reactions but I like to call it the light independent reactions and even that is a little misleading um, because it makes you think that those reactions can go on without light and the real um, the truth is that the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions they don't require light in order to happen directly but they do require um, the light dependent reactions in order for them to go on so in an indirect way those reactions do require light um, in that they require the products of the light dependent reactions that required light so um, that's why I, I like to call them the light independent reactions um, because they don't require light directly but they still use um, they still rely on the products of the light dependent reactions um, and the Calvin cycle if I were to just give you a, a short description of what's going on in the Calvin cycle it it actually requires ATP and this um, this electron carrier molecule that's known as a, a um, NADPH it's very similar to NADH uh, it just has a phosphate group and um, if we were to turn off the light and stop the light dependent reactions then uh, those two things the ATP and the NADPH wouldn't be produced and if those two things aren't produced then the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions can't happen and so you turn off the light and the Calvin cycle stops as well and so th that's why I think that light independent reactions is a better way of describing phase the second stage of, of photosynthesis um, but on the AP exam the way that uh, it'll typically refer to the Calvin cycle is um, they'll typically say light independent reactions and um, so what I'd like to do is walk you through a short overview of photosynthesis and here's here's how it basically basically uh, happens but I, I want to overemphasize the fact that energy is not being made um, I can't stress that idea enough photosynthesis is not the production of energy it's just the transformation through the processes of photosynthesis and cell respiration that provide us with materials organic materials that are high in energy so it's using sunlight 
and other uh, components, other enzymes, other reactants, in order to get us organic compounds uh, that contain energy. So it's just a conversion of one form of energy into chemical energy. Um, but the start is, um, the, the way I like to describe it is that it's converting energy from an unusable form, like light, into a usable form. Uh, like organic compounds, and it requires an inter, uh, some intermediate step, um, which is the production of some ATP and NADPH in order to make that organic compound, in order to make that usable form. So we start with light. Light is then used to power the light reactions, and the light reactions are happening in the thylakoid membranes, in the thylakoids of the chloroplast. And the products of the light reactions is actually the production of ATP and NADPH and we're going to use NADPH and ATP as a way of powering the Calvin cycle and the Calvin cycle is a cycle of reactions uh, that goes on in the stroma of the of the chloroplast and it uh, is a cycle that ends up producing a product and that product is the organic compounds uh, that, that we have. So that would be the glucose that's produced at the end of photosynthesis. So I'll post this, this video so you can click on it, but it's just a crash course biology that will go over um, some of the reactions that, that I'm gonna about to explain. So the first phase of uh, photosynthesis, like I explained a little bit before, is the light reaction phase. And the light reactions of photosynthesis involve these things called photosystems. And photosystems are just um, uh, clusters of pigment molecules that are, um, that are bound to proteins that are actually stuck in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplasts. So we have the thylakoid membrane. Inside the thylakoid membrane are these proteins that are floating in in there and uh, stuck within those proteins are the pigment molecules that we talked about before so the chloroplast the chlorophyll or the carotenoids all these different um, pigment molecules and uh, at the end of the photosystem we have this primary electron acceptor that we'll talk about a little bit later but you can think of uh, the photosystems as antenna molecules. They're like antennas that um, are waiting to be excited by uh, light. And there are two photosystems that um, we have. Uh, photosystem 2 is also sometimes called P680. And photosystem 2 is called P680 because it absorbs light best at a wavelength of 680 nanometers. And the second photosystem that we have is photosystem 1, and that's sometimes called P700. And that photosystem has pigment molecules that typically absorb light best at a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Um, and so, like I said, you can think of them as antenna that are waiting to capture light. And the, the photos photosystems, in terms of some history, were named in an order of their discovery. So um, we're going we're gonna to talk about this thing called non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And in that process, when scientists were, were trying to decrypt what was going on and figure out what was going on, they found out, they found photosystem, um, photosystem 2 before uh, photosystem 1. Um, and, and I'll explain what that means a little bit later, but you might see photosystem 2 appearing in the reactions before photosystem 1, but the reason why they're labeled that way is just because of uh, the way in which they were uh, discovered, not because one is happening before the other. And if you, you want some visual uh, as to uh, what this looks like, you see in the, the center, the yellow part, that would be the thylakoid membrane. And then these different colors that you see are the proteins. 
And it's within those proteins that we have the uh, molecules, the pigment molecules that are, that are about to be excited by sunlight, by light, by a photon of light. And that photon will come in contact with one of those pigment molecules. And that pigment molecule will actually begin, it will lose an electron, and that electron will go to a higher energy level. And that's what I want to explain now. So, um, phase one, I, I'm going to try and explain this in, in six steps. Um, but phase one starts with photosystem one. And photosystem one is going to act like an antenna, like I said before. Photosystem, I'm sorry, it's going to start with photosystem two. And photosystem two is um, a group of pigment molecules and photosystem 2 will absorb some energy uh, in, the, in the form of a photon, a particle of light. Um, and it will excite an electron, and that electron will jump to a higher energy level. And um, when that happens, photosystem 2 is going to eject or lose one of the electrons that it had before the photon of light hit it. And what's going to happen is we're going to need to replace that electron so that photosystem 2 can then be excited by another photon of light. So I want you to, to imagine that photosystem 2 has a finite number of electrons that make up the pigment molecules uh, that, are, that are there. If a photon of light hits a pigment molecule, that pigment molecule is going to become excited and it's going to lose an electron to a higher energy level. And when it loses that electron, it needs to replace that electron in order to be excited again by another photon of light. And if it doesn't, it can't be excited. And so that, that electron needs to be replaced. And the way it's replaced is through a process that's known as photolysis. And photolysis is um, a reaction, uh, it's basically the splitting of water using light. And um, it is the reaction that we use in order to replace the electron that was excited out of photosystem 2. And a byproduct of splitting that water to replace the electron is actually the release of um, oxygen. And the hydrogen ions from the water that is being split are going to be gathered and used to build a concentration gradient during, um, during the, the light reactions uh, in order for chemiosmosis to occur. And we know a little bit about chemiosmosis. It's just the buildup of um, an ion gradient on one side of a membrane and uh, that gradient can be used as a source of potential energy to power um, some enzyme. And in this case, in the, in the case of cell respiration, we had a chemiosmotic gradient in order to power the processes of ATP synthase. So in this situation, what we're hap what's happening is an electron is uh, jumping. It's being lost by photosystem 2, and it needs to be replaced. In order for the plant to replace it, they need to break a water molecule up. And they take the electron from that water molecule, they take uh, an electron from that water molecule, replace the one that was just lost, and as a result of breaking the water molecule up through photolysis, um, we have O2 being released as a byproduct, and we have hydrogen ions being pumped to the other side of uh, the membrane, and we start to build a concentration gradient. This whole process is known as uh, the non-cyclic pathway of um, the light reactions, and I'll explain why it's non-cyclic in a little bit, because there is also a cyclic pathway that works a little bit different, but the, the one I'll say is the most common is the non-cyclic pathway, and uh, that's what we'll, we'll study right now. So you see here, 
Photo System 2, which typically um, is excited by wavelengths of light that are about 680 nanometers. Photo System 2 is going to become excited. It's going to lose an electron. That electron is going to pass um, down a, an electron transport chain. And as it jumps from one protein in that electron transport chain to another, it's going to lose some of the uh, potential energy, the free energy that it has. And as a result of losing some of that potential energy, anytime we have an endergonic reaction, we can use that, that energy that's being lost um, as a form of energy to power another reaction. And that energy that's being lost as the electron is going from one protein to another, as it's going down uh, in free energy, we're going to use that loss of free energy the, the, um, as a source of energy to pump hydrogen ions that are um, being produced when we break down water to replace the electron in photosystem 2. We're going to use that energy of the electron going down the electron transport chain to actually pump photons uh, I'm sorry, to pump hydrogen ions from one side of the membrane to another. And as a result of us pumping those photons from one side to the other, we'll produce a gradient. And it's, a, it's called the chemiosmotic gradient. And then we'll use that gradient to... Um, we'll use that gradient later on, and I'll, I'll get into what we're going to use that gradient for in a bit. Um, this is... Uh, showing a bunch of different steps of um, the light reaction, but I just want to go back to, to this slide here, and I'm going to describe step three of the, the light reaction. So step three is um, when we have that excited electron traveling down a chain. I'm going to show you here. We have this excited electron traveling down a chain of... Um, that we'll call the electron transport chain. And that chain is actually made up of um, increasingly electronegative proteins that are called um, cytochromes. And as the electron that came from photosystem 2 goes down that electron transport chain um, that is electronegative, that has increasing electronegative uh, components to it, it's going to lose energy. And that energy that's lost is what is going to be uh, used to build a concentration gradient of protons. And that's called the, the chemiosmosis that we talked about. Um, so each cytochrome in that electron transport chain is a bit more electronegative than the next. So the first one is... Uh, slightly electronegative. The next one is going to be slightly more electronegative. The next one slightly more. And then it, it's because of that increase in electronegativity that the electron is going to jump from one protein, one cytochrome in the electron transport chain to the next until it gets to the last protein, the last cytochrome in that ETC that is the most electronegative. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to use the, uh, the energy that is being lost by the electron as it's going from the, most electroneg the, the least electronegative protein to the most electronegative. We're going to use the energy that's being lost by that to, um, to build the concentration gradient as part of coupled reactions. And the coupled reactions is basically when we have an endergonic reaction, like the one I am describing with the movement of the electron down the electron transport chain, and the need to pump hydrogen ions from one side of the gradient, from one side of the membrane to the other. And so we're coupling exergonic reactions to endergonic reactions. And we've seen that uh, theme over and over again. We saw it when we did cell respiration, and that's a really common theme throughout all of biology, throughout life of taking reactions that are exergonic, ones that release energy, and coupling them mm -hmm. with ones that are endergonic. Mm 
And that's, that's a really important concept. So I'm going to move on to the fourth step of the light reactions. And the fourth step is going on at the same time as uh, the first step that I described. So the first step was the movement of the ex, ex, um, us exciting the photosystem 2. Well, at the same time that photosystem 2 is being excited, photosystem 1 which is basically the same type of setup, is also being excited. Except it's just another set of, it's another group of pigment molecules. And this photosystem one is also absorbing light energy. And it's that light is typically at a wavelength of 700 nanometers. And it, when it's excited, it loses one of its electrons to a higher energy level. And those electrons... Um, will then be lost from that photosystem one and need to be replaced. And um, the photosystem, that electron that's lost, is replaced by the electron that was excited and subsequently lost from photosystem two. So we see the electron is being lost from photosystem two. It's going down an electron transport chain. When it's going down, it's powering the movement of hydrogen ions from one side of the, the membrane to the other, and that electron ends up um, then being passed from photosystem one, from photosystem two to photosystem one, and re and that electron replaces the uh, electron that photosystem one just lost when a wavelength of, for example, 700 nanometers hit that photosystem and caused it to lose its own electron and and um, and uh, went down that electron transport chain that photosystem one has. And so the the sixth step, the last step in this light reaction, would have been uh, the idea that the excited electron from photosystem one travels down another electron transport chain losing energy as it goes, and ultimately, the last step is that it reduces this NAD plus and a hydrogen ion into NADPH, which is an electron carrier. And it's through that loss in energy that is um, obtained when that electron lost in photosystem 1 is when that electron lost in photosystem one is passed down an electron transport chain and loses a little bit of electro uh, and loses a bit of, uh, of its energy, it's through that loss of energy that is driving the reduction of NAD plus into NADPH. And so it's a pretty uh, long process. Um, but I hope the majority of that made sense. Um, and you can read these descriptions here if you need to. It splits it up into about five, five different steps. Um, and it explains exactly where this stuff is going on. So here, this would be one thylakoid membrane. And it is, this would be photosystem two. This would be um, a protein. This would be uh, cytochrome. And this would be photosystem one. Then we'd have the enzyme that is allowing us to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. And then this would be the last step in this uh, uh, light reaction, which is basically us using the protons that are pumped to the inner part of the thylakoid membrane of the thylakoid, which is called the thylakoid lumen. And we use those protons to power the ATP synthase. In the same way, we use the proton gradient to power ATP synthase in cell respiration. And at, as a result of uh, doing this long process, we end up producing ATP by converting ADP and inorganic phosphate into this high energy molecule known as ATP. And then we'll use that ATP later on in uh, the next phase in order to uh, power uh, the production of 
organic material or um, glucose inside the plant. Um, so I'm just going to show you quickly using this this diagram. The outer part, the top part of the screen is the area of the stroma. You have the thylakoid membrane in between the green lines and then the thylakoid space is um, underneath. We have the two photosystems, photosystem 2, photosystem 1. They're both um, uh, being excited by different wavelengths. So we have the 680 with photosystem 2 and the 700 nanometers exciting photosystem 1 molecules. I want you to just um, think about the idea that uh, they both have a finite number of electrons. And I, I just said that they have... Um, that they have uh, 5,000 electrons. But in reality, it's just an, it's just an illustrative a point. I, I don't know how many electrons those photosystems have, but what I want you to know is that if there were no way to replace those 5,000 electrons after one is excited and leaves the photosystem, then eventually the number of electrons in each of those photosystems would go to zero, and then the process would stop. So I, I'm just using the number 5,000 as a, as a way to illustrate to you what's, it, what's going on. And then these orange um, circles, those would represent the proteins in the electron transport chain, the cytochromes, and then, of course, in the thylakoid membrane, we'd need to have some NAD plus um, molecules there, and then in the thylakoid membrane, of course, we'd have the ATP synthase uh, pro, uh, enzyme. And uh, I want you to think this cell is in equilibrium, which means that we, have, we would have equal concentration of hydrogen ion on one side as opposed to the other side. And on the, in, on the stroma side, we'd also have some ADP and some inorganic phosphates just floating around in that space, ready to be converted using ATP synthase into ATP. And then in the thylakoid space, we also have um, some molecules of water. And um, so let's start. Um, we have sunlight coming in. Those wavelengths of, of light are hitting the photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. They're exciting the pigment molecules that are in those photosystems. And the photosystems are losing an electron. The electron from photosystem 2 is going to be lost um, as it goes to a higher energy level. Photosystem 2's electron will go up to um, this, I'm going to go back one, will go up to this cytochrome right here. It will then be passed down e, the uh, increasing electronegative uh, cytochromes until it gets to this last cytochrome. And once it gets to this last cytochrome, it will be transferred, that electron will be transferred to photosystem 1. So we saw when we had the, the light hit these photosystems that they both lost an electron. They went from 5,000 electrons to, to um, 499, I'm, I'm sorry, 4,999 electrons. And when the electron here uh, is lost from photosystem 2 and goes down this electron transport uh, chain, it then replaces the electron that was lost in photosystem 1. So now we're back at 5,000 electrons in photosystem 1. This electron here is doing the same thing going down the electron transport gradient, uh, electron transport chain, the cytochromes, and it is being used to, to convert uh, to uh, power the enzyme that's converting NAD plus, reducing this guy into NADPH. And so once we have uh, NADPH, then um, the NADPH will, will stay there for the next step. And what we need to do is we need to um, then replace this electron that was lost in photosystem 2. And how are we going to replace the electron that's lost in photosystem 2? Well, we can do photolysis and we can break up the water that we have. And if we break up the water that we have, I'll, I'll describe that after this animation goes on, but if we break up the water that we have here, 
um, we can produce um, two uh, ions of hydrogen and oxygen and the electron from one of the hydrogens will go to make photosystem 2 have uh, it will go to replace the electron that was lost in photosystem 2 and now the electron total will be back to 5000 and um, as a result we're gonna have two ions of hydrogen and then we're gonna have some oxygen and it's that oxygen byproduct that's actually going to be uh, breathed out of plants or released by plants and it's a totally uh, in my opinion it's a it's a it's really a byproduct it's um it's just a it, it just so happens that oxygen is being released by plants and then if we think in terms of evolution it would be it would make sense for organisms to then rely on that oxygen as um, as the final electron receptor acceptor in uh, their electron transport chain if they're doing cell respiration, which it ends up being in the plants as well. So we'll see that there there's an increase of hydrogen ions on the one side um, because of the splitting of this water molecule, but at the same time, um, what's going to happen is as the electron is going from the electron transport chain here to photosystem one and from the electron transport chain in photosystem one to the enzyme that's converting a NADP plus to NADPH we're gonna have a, a small release of heat and that heat is what's gonna power the movement of these hydrogen ions in the stroma side to the opposite side into the thylakoid space and it's because of that heat that we move these ions to the to this side and once it's on this side we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions on the thylakoid space side and that starts to produce a gradient and it's because of that chemo chemioosmetic gradient that we can actually power this enzyme known as ATP synthase to convert inorganic phosphate and ADP into ATP so we have two products at the end of this light reaction that would be NADPH, that's one product that was reduced to form something that has more energy, more free energy. And then we also have another product, and that would be ATP. And that, of course, we know is, is a good source of energy for uh, what's about to happen next. And so if we were to just recap what, what happened in the light reactions, in the light reactions, the energy in the light is used to excite electrons to make ATP through this process of chemiosmosis and also to produce NADPH, which is an electron carrier, carrier to power the Calvin cycle, which is phase two. We haven't talked about it yet. The light reactions occur in and across the thylakoid membrane inside the chloroplasts. That's inside the, the cells and light and water are required, those are reactants. And then oxygen, ATP, and NADPH are all, um, they are products of the, um, of the light reactions. I just wanna go back real quick and, and um, make sure you understand one important aspect of this of these reactions that are going on. Um, as, uh, let me see exactly what that is. So uh, one key thing is the, is the membrane. Um, and that if there were no thylakoid membrane, or if the, if the integrity of the membrane were, so, let's say, disrupted or leaky, that it would be impossible for us to build a concentration gradient, not to mention the cytochromes, the photosystems, the ATP synthase wouldn't exist and they wouldn't, and probably if they did exist, wouldn't be functional. It's really important for us to understand that it is because of those membranes that all of these processes can happen. And um, in addition to that, think of it's the the chemiosmosis that's going on that the idea of osmosis or the movement of molecules from one area of high concentration to a, an area of low concentration uh, 
that's the same thing that's happening here where instead of it being water molecules they're actually protons or hydrogen ions that are being pumped from one side or that are being moved from one side to the other side of the the membrane instead of the the water molecules but the theory behind it is exactly the same regardless of us um, thinking about what is being moved um, and so you can read this on your own but it's basically everything that I've described so that's all known as the this the non-cyclic electron pathway this is uh, non-cyclic meaning that the electrons need to be replaced by the photolysis of water um, and the electrons are not being cycled or reused or recycled in any of the reactions um, they are passed down a chain that is non-cyclic so the products of the end of the pathway aren't being used in any way to power the beginning products of the reaction of the the reactions that happen at the beginning however this can happen sometimes in a cyclic manner and if it happens in a cyclic manner um, the process is a little bit different and so um, that's what I'm going to talk about right now we can um, we can think of uh, the light reactions happening in a cyclic, uh, when we say cyclic electron flow. And these reactions, um, what, we can, what we can see is that they're, um, they are a lot more ancient of a biochemical pathway than the non-cyclic phosphorylation um, pathway. And the reason why I'll say that is how can we know that it's more ancient? Well. In general, simpler mechanisms are older in terms of evolutionary time. And um, cyclic photophosphorylation, which is the process that I'm about to explain, is a lot simpler than non-cyclic photophosphorylation or electron flow. And since most um, photosynthetic bacteria use it, we can be quite confident that it is in fact an older mechanism and the way I like to think of it is that if you look at a 2018 version of a car compared to a 1918 version of a car um, the 2018 version is a lot more complex and can do a lot more than the 1918 version of a car the same thing applies for the non-cyclic and the cyclic photophosphorylation processes the cyclic one is a lot simpler than the non-cyclic one um, and a lot of bacteria actually use the cyclic one in order to to photosynthesize um, and so the difference between the two processes is that in the cyclic electron flow we do produce the ATP which is the most important product of this uh, light reaction but we do not produce the NADPH and only photosystem 1 is used as opposed to both photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. In the cyclic electron flow, the electrons are recycled. They're cycled through the pathway in order to produce the ATP. Instead of them being used to reduce NADP plus to NADPH. So that's another major difference between the cyclic and the non-cyclic. And... Uh, because they're recycled, we don't need to split water to maintain that um, the balance of electrons in the photosystem, like we did with the non-cyclic pathway. Um, so those are those are some some key differences. But uh, this is just describing what it might look like in a in a cyclic pathway, and I'm going to describe. It in an animation right here. So again, we have the photosystems. They each have 5,000 electrons. We have the electron transport chain or the cytochromes. We have the NADPATP+. We have the ATP synthase. We have the ions on the stromicide and the thylakoid space. We have the ADP in the phosphate. And uh, what I want you to remember is that photosystem two isn't involved in the non-cyclic in the cyclic pathway. Uh, so we should focus our attention on photosystem one. Uh, 
an electron is going to be lost by photosystem 1 if a wavelength of light that's around 700 nanometers hits photosystem 1. When that happens, we're going to decrease the number of electrons that photosystem has to 4,999. 4, it's then, I'm sorry, it's going to then pass down this uh, electron transport chain down the gradient. And instead of it being used, that electron being used to power the enzyme that'll convert NADP plus into NADPH, it's going to sit here at this last cytochrome until the next step that I'll describe in a bit. But it's not going to be used to power this enzyme that'll convert this guy into NADPH. So just remember it's sitting here. Also remember we have 4,999 4, electrons because it was just lost. And remember that some of the heat that is being uh, lost as the electron moves down this gradient is going to be used to power the hydrogen ions from one side to the other side. And that heat is going to allow us to have this concentration gradient that can then power ATP synthase to convert ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. So we'll still get the ATP at the end, but what will happen instead of this electron being used to reduce this guy and, for, and form the two products that we saw in the non-cyclic pathway, the electron will instead be transported back to photosystem 1, and it will uh, bring the total number of electrons, like I said, this is just an illustration, but bring the total number of electrons back to 5,000, just like the way it was before the photon of light came in contact with that photosystem. Now that it's back, Another photon can come and excite it and can be passed down. As it's passed down, form the gradient. The gradient's formed, power ATP synthase. ATP's made. The electron goes back to photosystem one. The whole reaction happens over and over and over again. And as we see, that electron is just recycled. It's never replaced by the photolysis of water like we saw in the non-cyclic pathway. So you can see it described here in a, in a different diagram. And um, this is just an overview as to the difference between non-cyclic electron flow and cyclic electron flow. Non-cyclic, we use the two photosystems, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Cyclic, we only use photosystem 1. In the non-cyclic, we've got to replace any lost electrons in photosystem 2 by breaking water. In the cyclic electron flow, we do not split the electrons to replace uh, split water to replace those electrons because we know that the electron is going to be recycled back to the photosystem after it's um, sent down the electron transport chain. In non-cyclic electron flow, oxygen is going to be released, and that oxygen came from the photolysis of the water. And if we're not breaking water in the cyclic electron flow, we wouldn't expect oxygen oxygen to be released. And in the non-cyclic pathway, we do produce NADPH because the electron that's lost from photosystem 1 and sent down the electron transport chain is used to power the enzyme that's converting NAD plus to NADPH. And if that electron is going back to photosystem 1 in the cyclic electron flow, we're not going to, of course, produce NADPH. And the similarity between the two is that ATP is produced in both the non-cyclic and the cyclic flow, electron flow. So um, that is a basic uh, rundown of exactly what's going on in the phase one light reaction. Um, and I will post this video uh, describing the difference between cyclic and non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So you'll be able to see that. Um, and this is just a, a description of us being able to put all of these things together to figure out exactly what's happening in the light reactions. Um, so we're, we can describe them as light dependent reactions because we're transferring energy in sunlight into chemical energy in the form of ATP and NADPH, which are then used to power the next set of reactions in phase two that are called the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle. That light and the water are required for the light reactions to occur and ATP, NADPH, and oxygen gas are produced as byproducts 
uh, well, the oxygen gas is being produced as a byproduct. The ATP and NADPH are produced as direct products through these light reactions um, of what we'll call non-cyclic photophosphorylation. In the cyclic photophosphorylation, um, of course, we're not going to produce the water, we're not going to produce the NADPH, and we're not going to produce the oxygen gas, but everything else is the same. And um, so uh, one a pretty big thing that I just want to focus on before I end the video is the idea of the evolutionary relationship between these cytochrome complexes that are found in both mitochondria and chloroplasts. And I want you to think back to the beginning of the year when we talked about this idea of descent with modification, where related genes play a similar but specialized role in cells. And the genes that are responsible for, for uh, the production of this cytochrome protein that is uh, allowing for the passage of electrons from one protein to the other, actually they're homologous genes. And they're similar because they're all derived from a common ancestor. And the electron transport uh, chain proteins that are found in the mitochondria and in the chloroplasts, they're, um, those proteins are all derived from homologous genes. They all came from homologous genes. And um, so that really is an indication that these cytochrome proteins um, have probably, the processes that, that are going on in the mitochondria and the chloroplast have evolved from uh, related uh, organisms. And that mitochondria and chloroplasts, if we think of them as uh, individual organisms outside of our uh, cells, outside of plant cells, outside of bacterial cells, they uh, function in a very similar way. And they function that way because they were probably derived from an, a similar ancestor, a common ancestor. And so if we synthesize the um, genome or the genes that are expressed to produce cytochrome B proteins, the genes are fairly similar and we say that they're homologous and that's an indication that the processes that we have going on in all living things are also very similar, that they are um, due to uh, an evolutionary relationship, which is, which is a cool thought. This is just a diagram to show the differences and similarities between the light uh, dependent cyclic non-cyclic pathways and the cyclic pathways and I'm sure you you know that if you've been paying attention and this is also just another um, table to show the difference between the two. So I'll end the the video here. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Email me. Um, stop by during uh, community time or during some break time and I'll be happy to answer your questions.